always say you're living good Pretty lawns with fancy landscapes She stares ahead with a blank gaze In her lovely neighborhood Where the living is good Good afternoon, uh, Mr. and Mrs. America and all the ships at sea. Thank you for joining us. This is Reverse Your Thinking, and I'm your host, Mark Gertz. I'm a mortgage broker in the county of Los Angeles and also your host for this show for the next hour. For those of you that are commuting on your way homes, uh, I hope you have a wonderful three-day weekend. I, I mean that sincerely from the bottom of my heart. I don't know about you, but it's been a really interesting start to the year, the last six or six or seven weeks. And I think everybody could deserve a well-earned break. Um, from what I understand, the snow up at Mammoth is just amazing this year. Um, and I'm sure lots of you are going to be headed up that way. And I, again, I hope you have a absolutely wonderful weekend. That music you heard uh, coming into the show was the great Angie Wells, who's a, a phenomenal jazz and blues singer. She has a new album coming out called Truth Be Told. That's going to be um, previewed at Vibrato uh, Grill Jazz in Los Angeles. Vibrato grilljazz.com. You can make reservations to see her. That'll be on March 2nd. All right. Angie Wells, March 2nd, Vibrato Jazz Grill. Don't miss it if you're in town. Uh, lots of things to talk about. We have an amazing guest uh, coming in in the middle of the show. Uh, which I'm going to tell you about in a little while. Um, lots of topics, lots of things to go over, many things that we need to change the way we, we look at them and reverse our thinking and take, a, and take a new look at things. And one of the things I want to talk about is reverse mortgages. Now, I know a lot about that. It happens to be the way I make my living. But um, there's lots of things about these products that, that people are not aware of. And I'm not talking about going into chapter and verse about fact versus fiction and what you know and about the fact that the bank does not take the house and all that good stuff. It's about a way, it's about a way the way these products get used. And there's this really interesting article that came out. Um, and, um, and the author of it uh, is a guy named Jack Guttenberg, who's been around since... Um, the dark ages. He's Jack's a Jack's a, a great guy, uh, based in Pennsylvania, and and he knows he knows more about reverse mortgages than the U.S. government. That's that's how much he knows about these products. And let me let me read you what he says here. He says, "Heckam Reverse Mortgages." Now, Heckam stands for Home Equity Conversion Mortgage. They were signed into law in 1988, became permanent in 1998. Okay, Heckam Reverse Mortgages have never been used as a component of retirement plans, although that was their original purpose. You hear that? Okay. The original purpose of reverse mortgages was to be part of retirement planning. All right. He goes on to say that they've been marketed as a standalone option for people in financial distress, and their public perception has been correspondingly abysmal abysmal. I've had people come and say to me that they would never, never even consider a reverse mortgage because of the advertising they see and the way that these programs are marketed, all right, as a standalone solution to desperation. Um, he goes on to say, to the extent that advocates for the elderly, such as AARP, warn against them, integrating Heckam's into retirement plans should cause a major shift in attitude. Think about this. AARP, people swear by AARP, and they, and they uh, uh, talk negatively about reverse mortgages without any facts and dissuade people who are suffering from considering these as part of their financial planning. And one of the things is, that's happening because of this is that there's been a a, a sea shift, a big shift in the way some of the largest reverse mortgage companies are now approaching their products and the public. And what they're doing instead is they're making entrees to financial planners 
For example, uh, Finance of America Reverse, which happens to be one of the lenders that I also carry, uh, have engaged in financial advisor trade groups. These include the Financial Planning Association and some others. Um, and this is critical. This is, this is a sea shift. These programs have been available since 1998 on a permanent basis. And the financial planning community has basically turned their back on them, right? And finally, finally, people in positions of authority are going to be uh, encouraged to integrate reverse mortgages into their planning. This is Mark Gertz. Reverse your thinking. We'll be right back. And we're back on Reverse Your Thinking. I'm your host, Mark Gertz. You're listening to KMET. Um, you know, there might be somebody out there that has a question regarding some of the things that we cover on the show, or there might be somebody out there that disagrees with my opinion, all right? Or there actually might be one or two people that agree. <laughs> if you do any of those things, please give me a call, 951-922-3532. Again, 951-922-3532. We would love to hear from you. Okay. Absolutely love it. Anyway, um, before the break, we were talking about uh, a C shift in reverse mortgages. I want to do a C shift now, and I want to talk about Medicare and Social Security for a moment. And I'm sure this has interest for everybody in the listening audience, because you're either getting it, or you're going to get it, or you think you're going to get it. Because this article, uh, written by Zachary Wolf, um, basically states that Medicare and Social Security insolvency is right around the corner, right around the corner. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the things that he says about how it happened and all the rest of that. What I thought was really interesting about this was the, co the conclusions that he came to about how to solve the problem. Let's just assume for a moment the problem really is, is real and tangible, okay? Here's what he suggests to solve the problem of insolvency in Social Security and Medicare. Um, in order to make them solid for the next 75 years, the trustees of these programs, the people that the government pays to ma manage them and take care of them, have done the math, and they say three things can be done to have Social Security and Medicare not, not collapse. Number one, they want to increase the payroll tax that funds Social Security from 12.4% to 15.6%. 12.4 to 15.6. That means basically 15% of your pay would be taken back and set aside to fund Social Security and Medicare to guarantee that when you retire, it's still going to be there. Number two, they want to reduce the benefits by more than 20%. I hear this collective sigh in the audience. Reduce benefits by 20%, one-fifth to all current and future recipients or more than 24% of future beneficiaries. Now, while this might be necessary, this would be like huge for some people. I've met people that are, are living, are living on a thousand dollars a month of social security. That's their only income. And in order to keep the, 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 the funds solvent, they are suggesting cutting their benefits by 20%. For a person that's got a thousand dollars a month of social security, that means 200 bucks a month. That could be the difference between making it and not making it. Many times this is where reverse mortgages come in to solve that problem. But nevertheless, if you don't have a house, we can't do a mortgage for you. So this applies to renters too. And the third suggestion was combine some version of the tax increase and the benefit reductions. Um, one of the things that President Biden suggested was raising corporate taxes and taxing the wealthy, which in some ways is a good idea, especially corporate taxes, because so many corporations pay absolutely nothing. But the problem, of course, that we have now with corporations is that if you raise the taxes too high, they'll take 
their entire business or parts of their business overseas to other countries or states where they get a better deal. Um, so there's no simple answers to this, but it is a serious problem. And it is something that you, as, as the voters, as the country, need to be aware of. And you need to contact your Congress people and ask them what their opinion is on these things. What do they think should be done? How do they think should be done? Are they doing anything about it? Or are they just running in circles, you know, trying to beat each other up? These are the type of things that, that you need to reverse your thinking on. You can do something about it. You can make an input. You need to con contact your Congress people and, and talk to them about, you know, what are we going to do to keep Social Security and Medicare solvent? All right. Um, another thing that we can do is to be aware and to be conscious of separating facts from fiction when we hear politicians talking. And, you know, even though the majority of the country did not listen to President Biden's State of the Union speech, um, some people did. Some people did. And um, one of the things that a lot of newspapers and television shows do is they check, they fact check, all right? You, you may remember during the Trump administration, that was, that was sort of a, a, a job for a lot of people because there were so many, so many inaccuracies. Um, but there are people doing the same thing um, in relation to this administration. And, um, and one of the things they found was that to a very great to a very great degree all of the things that president biden talked about in his state of the union speech were true he stayed really really close to the truth on absolutely everything that he talked about um if you get a chance one of the one of the things about the internet nowadays is that nothing ever disappears nothing if you didn't listen to the president's State of the Union speech, you can find it online. And the reason that's important is because he talked about facts. So if you want to get it straight from the top, go online, find his State of the Union speech and listen to it. We're going to be back with our guest, Corey Walker, right after this. This is Mark Gertz. You're listening to Reverse Your Thinking. back. Uh, this is Reverse Your Thinking. I'm your host, Mark Gertz. Uh, I'm a mortgage broker in uh, Los Angeles County and beyond. Um, and, uh, and today, I'm your radio host. And I am happy to introduce our guest today, who is Corey Walker. Let me tell you a little bit about Corey. Um, he's a commercial and residential architect in Los Angeles. He specializes in creating contemporary building designs at a local and national basis. With his combined background in contemporary residential and commercial design, he brings a diverse set of tools to the drawing board to create warm and inviting spaces that are unique to each project. Ooh. Corey's been involved in a number of award-winning designs and is a leader through the entire process of building creation from conceptual design to construction closeout. How you doing, Corey? Doing good, Mark. Good. Thanks good. for having me. Yeah, it's great to see you. It's great to see you. I want to I, I want to ask you a a, a, a question that if, if it was really me here I would actually ask you all right um, people when they get involved in doing having a house built for themselves or they get involved in um, you know uh, modifying a project or building an ADU or something like that they're really familiar with contractors all right they 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 think contractor they don't think a lot of times architect all right so could you explain to us why people why people should should talk to an architect before they build or or remodel something yeah so the truth is you actually you don't need an architect to build two-story wood frame construction 
Okay. So people think right off the bat, like, okay, I need a contractor to swing the hammer and put this thing together. But in Los Angeles, in California, we have very strict regulations. We have coastal zones. We have hillside zones. We have very strict zoning rules. And sometimes it's difficult to navigate. A contractor knows how to read plans and build a house. They're not really into reading the codes and getting this, this design approved, one, by you and your wife, and two, by the city. So sometimes it's good to hire an expert to go through that motion and get that permit quicker and well done, something you don't have to worry about. Is, is that what an architect would do? That's what an architect does for home design. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, what, about, what about new construction? Um, I mean, if, if I was to sit with a contractor and let's say he, he opens up a book and he says, here, here's, here's, here's 20 different homes, pick one. Okay. Um, why wouldn't I do that as opposed to sitting down with an architect like you and, you know, designing something differently? You know, that happens so much. Like so many owners come to us with a preconceived idea of this is exactly what I want to do. And they haven't quite thought it all the way through. Um, these, these designs that are in a book, they have been designed at one point to fit a particular site. And a site, a house needs to be oriented for the sun uh, so you can control the heating and cooling of a space. You actually want to like block the southern sun so you don't get too hot. In Los Angeles, like it gets hot here. Like we got to like shade our home and interior spaces for that. Mm -hmm. um so there's also views each site has a different view mm -hmm. each site has a different approach to the front door each site like may have existing trees on on it it may have its own set of zoning regulations that actually don't even meet the custom home that the the contractors brought to us mm -hmm. so even if we tried like sometimes it just doesn't even fit with the codes these days that update every three years and someone may have a design from 2002 that just doesn't even work anymore. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, so would an architect, would an architect, you, you know, one of the things that's happening in, in the city of Los Angeles uh, in particular is uh, a lot of people are buying houses um, and, and they're totally demolishing them and, and starting from scratch. Um, would that be a situation where you bring in an architect, would that be the first person that you, you call? And, and at the same token, when would you bring them in? I mean, would it, would it make sense to consult an architect before you even buy the property to, um, to, to de demolish it? Yeah, I mean, the big question, I mean, the big statement is like, it depends is what we say. It really depends on the specific law and like the situation. Um, so like, if someone's got a healthy budget to do something really nice and they want to, let's say they're demolishing a one-story house and, and trying to build a two-story house, mm -hmm. um, you know, some, sometimes it would, it would make sense to hire an architect at the beginning before you even purchase the lot to do mm -hmm. the zoning research and figure out like, are we actually going to be able to build the maximum, or is, is the maximum amount we're allowed to build going to fit the needs of me and my family? Mm -hmm. some, Sometimes not. If you're building on a hillside home, the amount you can build is based on the slope of the lot. So sometimes that minimizes uh, the amount of floor area you can build. And, and it often, sometimes people are stuck with the lot that doesn't work for them and they have to resell it. So it's, okay. it is good to consult an architect, uh, even for a small like one to $3,000 feasibility study like on that lot, just to get peace of mind when you're built, when you're buying a million dollar uh, piece of land, right? It's pennies on the dollar. It, it, it's interesting, you know, because um, on, on divorcing your mortgage, we, we talk a lot about certified divorce financial analysts and about contacting one of them before you even find an attorney or even, you know, uh, serve your spouse with a, a divorce. It, it almost sounds like an architect kind of is in a, in a similar situation that, that, you, before you even buy property, you should maybe consult with an architect um, because uh, unless you're going to walk into an existing structure and do absolutely nothing to it, 
okay? Um, you know, it, it, it's something that you need to um, collaborate with a professional about. Am, am I on the right track here? Am I thinking correctly? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, and, and there's more to it than that. Like an, an architect also is a psychologist and because uh, like often, oftentimes a husband and wife have a really difficult time agreeing on what to do. And a contractor is just going to really like take your orders and, and follow through. And if you give a contractor the wrong order, they're going to come back and say, Oh, well, you changed your mind. I'm going to, I'm going to need an, an extra 200,000 to, to do that. Right. So it's really good to give a contractor a really specific uh, instruction to build your plan. And an architect's job is to dig deep in the couple and figure out what exactly they want to build and resolve maybe the tension between the couple to get them to agree on something together that they actually fall in love with something they didn't even expect. Uh -huh. It's actually, an, it's an art form versus just technically carrying out the build of their project. See, that's interesting. I've never heard, I've never heard from anybody um, about an architect as almost being like um, a, a psychologist um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation like that. And, and that's kind of interesting because in, in the course of what I do as a certified um, an accredited financial uh, 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 consultant, um, I, I kind of do the same thing with dealing with people's psychology in relation to their money. And it sounds almost like you're dealing with people's psychology in relation to their home. Yeah. Is that right? And, yeah, exactly. And just to add on that, the journey of, of building a home, when, let's talk about building a custom ground up home. Okay, let's do or it. De yeah, or demoing a small 1950s home and, and building a two-story. Um, it's a long journey. It's it's one year to three year uh, project, uh -huh. and managing that relationship and and making it a positive experience is something that architects are good at because it's such a long journey, and there's so many decisions that need to be made on time so that it doesn't go backwards. So, okay, architects know how to nav. Good architects know how to navigate that. Yeah, you see, and 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 what's interesting is that is that I think in I think in a lot of people's minds, you know, architects are like, ooh, architects, you know, it's it's like um, um, it, it, it's 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 like a higher end professional, you know, it, it it's not for me, it's only for you know other people, you know, um, but but the average, I don't think the average homeowner thinks in terms of uh, uh, architects, people like you know the middle class. People that may, maybe make you know a uh, hundred or two hundred thousand dollars a year, which nowadays is just you know middle class incomes for a family of four. Um, a lot of times they, they don't think uh, uh, that they need or that they they're they're worthy of an architect. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, a, a lot of the middle class they just don't know what type of value an architect could bring to their process. Mm -hmm but financial value an architect could bring to their lot that can be made up in the back end. Let's say they're in their forties and they do a project with an architect and their home value has gone up significantly by a million dollars. When they're, when they're approaching retirement, now they call you and they have a lot of money to draw from, from a reverse mortgage. <laughs> Did, let me ask you this. I don't want to put you on the spot, but in relation to what you were just talking about, can, uh, do you have an example? Do you have any clients that you've worked with that where that actually kind of happened with, with, with that added value type of thing? Yeah. I mean, you know, it really like clients really make money when they buy the lot. So they have to they have to know what they're buying. And like we mentioned before, like it's good to consult an architect before buying the project or the lot. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if the client bought, made a good deal in buying the lot, then there's so much potential to add more. And um, yeah, we, we just finished a, a remodel in Encino and it's on the market for $40,000 a month right now for, for a lease which is significantly higher than they were. <laughs> they went from I'm, 10 to 40. 
I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did, did you say $40,000 a month rent? Yeah. It's a wow. different, uh, it must be some yeah. house. It's a, yeah. Must be some house. Um, so, so in other words, by, by engaging you and you and your firm, um, ahead of time, you were able to help them design the remodel so that they could multiply the rental value of the property by, by 300%. Yeah. And even more so for Airbnbs, actually. Airbnbs are even hotter than just long-term rentals. Can you right explain, now. can you explain what you, what you mean by that? Yeah. I mean, if anyone's been following the Airbnb game, um, I mean, special specifically like Joshua Tree and some areas that are near national parks, mm -hmm. the amount uh, people are paying uh, per night for special uh, Airbnbs that have been designed with an experience. People pay for an experience. People pay for Disneyland for the experience. Mm -hmm. People go to Joshua Tree for an experience. And if you hit the upper end of the market, there is a lot of value to be had um, from a piece of architecture on the Airbnb market, not just your standard run of the mill, but luxury. That's very interesting. That's, that's, that's something, again, you hit me with another thing that I've never, I've never heard about before. So in other words, what you're saying is that uh, in the short-term rental market, if, if you have a property that's more than just um, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a, and a, and a bed, the, the, actual, the actual rental itself is part of the experience of, of where they're going. Is that what you're, you're basically saying? Yeah, yeah. We're actually doing one in Joshua Tree right now and we're even writing the guest book. And oh. yeah, we're, we're putting uh, lavender oil in, in the bathroom. We're doing heated floors. We're doing, uh, our, our guest book is about a connection to nature. And we hired a landscape architect for this project uh, that is going to attract local birds and improve the wildlife out there. Uh, so people, wow, people love the earth and like they want to be part of this experience. And it's we're creating this thing called healing in the desert for this project. Um, so I want to keep it general and not talk about specifically that project, but sure, man, there's so much uh, potential in the Airbnb market. But just in general an architect does add a, a ton of value to the building process. Yeah. You, you, you know, you, what you're making me think about is you're making me think about people that like take, take vacations and they stay in a castle or people that take vacations and they stay in a, in a snow hotel or something or like that or, yeah. or a spaceship or something. Yeah, exactly. So, so, it's, so that, that the, the residents, I think what, you, what I think I'm hearing you say is that, is that the residence becomes part of the vacation. The, the actual just being in that space and and that and that what an architect can do is they can envision that they can envision the experience of the space before um it's built and then because and because now it's it's an experience not just a place to put your stuff while you go to the national park or something um you're talking about uh, charging a lot more about that, that people because people are going to pay for that. Is, is that what I'm I'm hearing you say? Yeah, exactly. It's it's it can be like best related to art. You know, ah. some some art is is fifty cents. You know, and and something that could look very similar uh, by someone who's an excellent storyteller and has created a metaphor with this art could be worth millions. So storytelling is an aspect to connect to people's emotion and art is experience is, is an emotional experience. Mm -hmm. and, and that, yes, that can drive up dollars in an Airbnb um, through an architect who knows how to storytell like that. Okay. So, so I've stayed in some Airbnbs, all right. And, and usually, and usually I'm paying like two, $300 a, um, a day. Okay. But but if I'm staying in an experience instead of in just a place, what kind of numbers are, are you talking about being able to, to charge? So, I mean, it really varies like per of course, location. But range. Uh, 
but specifically for Joshua Tree, since we have the most experience there, um, the experiences start at $500 per night and go all the way to $1,900 per one night. For one so night, you, okay. You stay so, three nights a weekend. That adds up for the owner right. who's the investor as well. Gotcha. So, so you're talking, you're talking about potentially, you know, multiplying, multiplying your return by anywhere from two to 500%. That's, that's absolutely remarkable. Um, you're listening to um, Reverse Your Thinking. I'm your host, Mark Gertz, and we'll be back right after this. back and I'm your host Mark Gertz this is reverse your thinking and we are talking with architect Corey Walker um, who's been giving us some incredible information about um, the value of engaging an architect uh, with regard to buying investment property and renting it out either long term or short term like Airbnb um, Corey you've mentioned a few times um, the experience of, of a space and, and the connection to nature. Um, can you can you elaborate on on that a little bit in terms of the uh, the, the the nature to uh, to home experience? Oh yeah, Mark. This is actually kind of like our ethos for Walk Studio for our firm, um, uh -huh. and I think like it's best explained in how it relates to hospital design and. You know, over time, I think around like 2010, uh, maybe even earlier as like 2000s, uh, hospital design has changed to incorporate a connection to nature or biophilic design to promote healing and reduce recovery time in patients. So they're saying if you give a patient uh, a window to open to get fresh air for a cross ventilation, if you give the patient a view to look at and see the butterflies, actually see nature, see mm. birds, see trees, they're going to reduce uh, recovery time and heal faster. The same thing could mm. be applied to home design. When you come home, it's a, it's a place that you've created to heal and get ready for the next day, both mentally and physically. And there's ways to optimize that with design. Okay, the, the, the only thing that I've ever heard of that sounds like this is feng shui. Is that what we're talking about here or is this something else? Yeah, there's a, there's a ton of names for it. Biophilic design, feng shui is a part of it. Connection to nature is what we call it. Yeah, it's all the same stuff. And it's basically just relating to what humans were like before modern day. Mm -hmm. and what in their natural state, they, they want sunlight. They want to be, but they don't want to be in direct sunlight. We need shelter and, and right. to protect ourselves from a uh, direct uh, source of light. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so basically what I'm hearing you say is that um, part of the value of engaging an architect early on in the process is that um, he and, and you in particular can, can look at uh, a building from that point of view about, about being something that can be integrated with the, the nature of where it's being built. Okay. For the, for the actual health and benefit of the, of the homeowners. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you want some strategies that, that we do in some of our projects to, to sure, take together? a minute? You know I mean? Yeah. Just, just, I mean, yeah, don't, don't get, just give us the reader's digest version. Yeah. I mean, just, just five quick points. Um, sure. Create, you can create a visual connection to nature. Like we talked about to reduce stress, mm -hmm. a non-visual, like maybe you can hear birds and you can even replicate the sound of that to get the benefits cross ventilation to get uh, airflow in there. Um, an indoor outdoor experience where you can, you can, design big sliders to open up, preferably on both sides of a room to get the cross ventilation through. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, dynamic light, meaning you actually see the sunrise and sunset, which controls your circadian rhythm uh -huh. and you sleep better at night because of that. That's so these, yeah. these strategies, you know, 
may just seem like, oh, it's, it's a nice to have, um, but realtors actually talk about these strategies in their real estate deals. Like, hey, check this out. This, this is actually improving uh, the lot, the house. When I, when I went to your website before this, I remember there was something there about water, about the, the importance of water. And, I, and I'm wondering, how do you incorporate that in like a desert home, like you're talking about in Palm Springs or, or somewhere else? Yeah, you know, water's hard in the desert because it can evaporate fast. Um, but I mean, a pool is a body of water that you can use to cool off mm -hmm. and uh, you can get a reflection off of the water that uh -huh. can reflect different light on a ceiling, which just looks beautiful. Uh, uh -huh. But water actually can control your emotional reaction or your emotional behavior. Mm -hmm. We always recommend putting water next to a kitchen because kitchens are actually a point where a moment in the house where arguments happen. And if you have a body of water or maybe even just a fountain where you hear water next uh -huh. to the kitchen, you can actually control the, the emotional reaction a little bit better. So, so it could even be something just like what you're saying, like a, like a fountain or something, you know, or, or the sound of running water or something to, to that effect. Am, am, yes. am, I, am, I, am I getting you right? Absolutely. And, and that's, that's a very Japanese uh, kind of feng shui move um, just to control your, your emotional and connect to nature. Very that's interesting. One of the easiest ones. Yeah. To remember. Very interesting. Well, let me ask you this. What would be, what would be the first steps for uh, a homeowner in, in hiring an architect? Yeah. I, I mean, like we mentioned earlier, if, if they're looking at a lot, it's good to have an architect or somebody experienced as their advisor to help them make a good buy because right. as an investment, like your money is made on the, the buy, the purchase, mm -hmm. but also like we could build uh, value into the investment through design. So, but the first step we recommend is doing a feasibility study, which depending on the lot and the zoning, um, it's anywhere from like one to $3,000. Uh -huh. And it's just a, a rough study on how much you can build on what the maximum height is and really how much value you can get out of your project and which consultants to hire. So I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, what do you need as an architect uh, to start a design? What do you need from the owner? Oh yeah. Uh, it really depends on the site. Um, but first, a scope of work, a rough budget. When I say budget, like, I mean something rough because a lot of people like will come with one, but then they want the moon. Just, just give us a wish list and mm -hmm. we'll help you figure out um, exactly where to land with the budget. Just have a rough budget in mind. And once we start like getting into the design process, we might need an arborist, a surveyor, a permit expediter, a structural engineer, interior designer, landscape architect. There's, there's a lot of people involved. Um, owners can do this themselves without an architect, but we're the experts and the quarterbacks in managing all these people. Yeah, well, people can write books too, okay? But it, does, it doesn't mean they're gonna get published or anybody's gonna read them, so yeah. I, I get it. Um, well, um, first of all, how can people get in touch with you? Oh, thank you, Mark. The best way is, I mean, literally send me a text, 949-633-0977, or send me an email, corey at walks-studio.com. All right. Can, give us that information again, because, you know, a lot of people weren't ready to write it down. Yeah, my cell, just send me a text, 949-633-0977. And my name is Corey. And my email is Corey at walks-studio.com. It's C-O-R-Y at walks-studio.com. You're listening to Reverse Your Thinking. I'm your host, Mark Gertz. We'll be right back. you're thinking for those of you that have been on the been listening to the show since the beginning you i don't know about you 
we had Corey Walker on, an architect, and I was just riveted by the things that he told us. Um, I really, uh, I really hope you were here listening because there was some really, really great stuff there. Um, there's a um, there's a newsletter that people can subscribe to that's put out by the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic, they have this um, Mayo Clinic Health Letter that you can subscribe to monthly. They actually send you a physical copy. I know that's old fashioned, but you can also get it on. You also get it electronic. But anyway, um, the um, the uh, issue for uh, February of 2023 is about caregiving. Um, and I thought it was really interesting and it was something that we should address uh, because, you know, a lot of people in this country are taking care of somebody else uh, in one way or another. But until I read this article in, in the Mayo Clinic uh, health, health newsletter, I didn't realize how pervasive it was. Um, and according to them, 53 million Americans provide informal care in the United States. Informal care is defined as unpaid, unpaid. So in other words, if you're taking care of an elderly parent or you have uh, special needs kids that are adults and you're taking care of them, you're, you're one of 53 million. Think about that for a minute, okay? There's about 330 million people in this country According to this, 15 to 20% of them are taking care of somebody. That's a big deal, okay? And, and of that 53 million, 24% are caring for more than one person. And about two in three caregivers are women. So 66%, 67% of of. 20% of the country are women taking care of other people. And I'm going to probably need that too. You, you might notice that I've got, the, I've got a collar on my neck because I had some surgery on my neck. All right. If this thing doesn't work, I'm going to need someone to take care of me. Um, but, you know, I'm just joking. Anyway, the point is, the point is um, people are taking care of other people in this country. People are taking responsibility for their elderly parents or other relatives, sometimes even friends or coworkers. We don't hear about this. You hear about people being, elderly people being put in nursing homes or, or left in assisted living facilities, but, but almost 20% of the population is taking care of their relatives, unpaid, unpaid. Now in the state of California, you can actually get paid for taking care of um, your relatives. I would imagine the same thing applies in other states in the country as well. Um, here's some other interesting statistics. About 10% of caregivers, now keep in mind, 53 million people, 10%, that's over 5 million of these caregivers are taking care of a spouse with dementia. Five and a half million people are taking care of a spouse with dementia. Those are staggering numbers. About 66% of caregivers live with the loved one that they are taking care of, which means in a lot of, in a lot of cases, it's a spouse or it's an adult child. Uh, quite a few of my clients are in situations like this. And one of the reasons why they do a reverse mortgage is to be able to have the money so that the person who's taking care of them doesn't have to work. They can take care of them full time. So they use money from a reverse mortgage line of credit to take care of expenses and other things so that they can take care of their parent and the parent doesn't have to be put in a facility. Um, and 25% of these people that are taking care of people uh, are a member of what's called the sandwich generation. Um, and they're caring for both an older adult and a child under 18. That's a little complicated. Let me put it to you in a different way. 25% of caregivers are taking care of kids and an elderly adult at the same time. 
a lot of them are also still working. The amount of stress that this puts on the caregivers is astronomical, absolutely astronomical. And then we also have to ask ourselves, how many people need caregivers and don't have one and don't have a family member that can take care of them and don't have the money to have in-home health care? This is a chronic uh, epidemic problem in our country. But at the same token, 50 to 55 million people are taking care of elderly relatives. This all came out of the Mayo Clinic Health uh, newsletter. I highly recommend uh, you look into it and consider subscribing. Um, I had wanted to get into compound interest with you today. I wanted to reverse your thinking about investing money, um, but we're running out of time. But let's just touch on it and maybe we'll take it up again next week. Many of you are spending every single dime you have every single week. You have to stop. You have to allocate money for savings. You have to teach your children how to allocate money for savings. I'm not talking about hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars. For those of you that are living close to the vest and working maybe minimum wage jobs, take 10 bucks a week. 20 bucks a week, set up a savings account, let the money work for you, all right? Make it, make it your religion to save money and not spend every single dime. My name is Mark Gertz. I'm a mortgage broker in Los Angeles and I serve the state and beyond. You've been listening to Reverse Your Thinking. I hope we changed your mind on some stuff. Come back next week. Thanks for listening. Where the living is good